Hello, good afternoon, and welcome to Affects Ex Machina, Unboxing Social Data Algorithms. This year, we have aimed to explore how digital culture has become instrumental for what Raymond Williams once called structures of feeling. You have already heard us saying that a couple of times. And uh, we specifically wanted to look into how today's technologies of feeling, meaning the platforms, the apps, the devices that we're using, capture emotions, classify behaviors, and orchestrate affects. Now, we seem to specifically examine this field that concerns the expansion of algorithmic influence through the capturing and processing of emotional data. For the curating of this panel, we turn to Matteo Pasquinelli, professor for media philosophy at HFG and initiator of KIM, a research group focusing on critical studies in machine intelligence. The following panel is actually the outcome of uh, our collaboration with Matteo and Ariana Dongus, a research associate of Kim. And there was a great exchange of thoughts, ideas, and knowledge, and I would like to warmly thank both of them for that. The panel will be introduced and moderated by Ariana, who is a researcher, but also a writer, focusing on the intersection of biometrics, colonial pasts, new forms of work, and machine intelligence in relation to today's digital economies. Her recent publications include journalistic reports and essays, as well as film and photography. Ariana is currently following her PhD at HFK, where, as I said, she's also a member of the research group for critical studies in machine intelligence. Please welcome Ariana, who will introduce the speakers. Thank you. Yeah, good afternoon, everyone, also from me, and welcome to this panel. Thank you, Daphne, for the nice introduction. Um, again, another thank you uh, from my side or from our side. Um, we want to thank uh, Daphne and uh, the organizers of the festival, also on behalf of HFG Karlsruhe, for initiating this new cooperation. Um, the idea of this panel uh, was born as a collaboration um, between Transmediale and the research group KIM um, at HFG. So KIM stands in German for, for, uh, for Künstliche Intelligenz uh, und Medienphilosophie and is coordinated, as we already heard, by Matteo Pasquinelli and me as part of the Department of Art Research and Media Philosophy. What was celebrated for many years in German new media schools as the digital Bauhaus, the integration of political theory, research and art practice, probably has to be updated today towards new challenges, towards something like the neural Bauhaus, if you like this term I made up. A possible example of this we saw yesterday in the reworking the brain panel. At HFG, we give particular attention to media politics today. That means politics of data and increasingly complex algorithms, including AI. On one side, we study and record the social impact of these algorithms on society. On the other side, and here comes the fun part, we also try to break the black box and study alternative uses of AI and of computation from below. So we don't believe in the black box uh, rhetoric, in the new obscurantism that claims that we don't know how AI works, that we don't know how algorithms for social data analysis work and that we have no control over them. For instance, in collaboration with Adam Harvey and the Syrian Archive, we 3D printed models of illegal ammunitions to train neural networks in order to recognize those ammunitions in video footage from the Syrian war. As presented yesterday in the panel, Archives for Collective Resistance. At KIM and HFG, we want to explore new forms of activism and civic participation at the level of increasingly complex technological abstractions. I guess it is common sense today to say that data is the new currency of corporations and that data are the medium of state control. But, of course, the situation is more complicated. For instance, yesterday, in her keynote on carceral temporalities, Jackie Wong mentioned this hypothesis of a global high-tech data panopticum that Nick Bostrom envisions that is facilitated by the alibi to protect a vulnerable planet since technological process has made it easier than ever to cause destruction on a planetary scale. 
As much as we challenge AI as a medium of political control, we should also investigate its economic impact, its effects on labor markets, and measurement of labor. There's a new universe of precarious labor behind the avatar of AI. So in my own research at HFG, I study new techniques of biometric control in refugee camps in Jordan and North Iraq, where this new metrics of computation integrates with the economy of war and humanitarianism and produces new computational measurements of labor time. Our panel today examines how machine learning and obscure algorithms analyze and manipulate individual effects into political sentiments, eventually amplifying class, gender, and racial bias. So these new forms of data capture, be the data emotional, behavioral, or biometric, enable a new form of governance that is algorithmic, rendering new forms and levels of control and surveillance over lives possible. By that, they are exposing mostly those people in our societies that are already marginalized by the dominant powers. So it's time to find ways to reclaim not only our data, but also our effects and transform them into new counter-infrastructures, if you wish, as collective forms of social resistance beyond fragmented filter bubbles. So how is it possible to reverse engineer the expanding capturing of emotional data? Which forms of resistance are possible against social data algorithms? From upcoming European elections in May this year, by the way, also in India, to data surveillance in India, the speakers will discuss and present new projects and strategies of algorithmic activism and data sovereignty. The people we invited work to make biases visible, to show the inner logics of machines and its design, to develop tools that serve as counter-infrastructures against today's seemingly monolithic and privatized global networks of control and vision. So let me introduce the speakers now that will give their inputs in the same order. Carolyn Sinders is a machine learning designer, researcher, and artist. She's the founder of Convocation Design and Research and has worked with Amnesty International, Intel, IBM Watson, and the Wikimedia Foundation. She's a research fellow at the Harvard University's Kennedy School of Government and Policy. Her work has been featured at the MoMA PS1, the Houston Center for Com Contemporary Art, among many others. Claudio Agosti is a self-taught hacker who since the late 90s has gradually become a techno-political activist. In the last decades, he worked on whistleblower protection with global leaks, advocated against corporate surveillance, and founded Alex for Algorithms Exposed campaign, of which Facebook Tracking Exposed or Tracking Exposed is one of the tools he will talk about today. He's a research associate in UVA detective team and the Vice President of the Hermes Center for Digital Human Rights. Nayantara Ranganathan is a researcher based in Bangalore, working on a feminist politics of data and speech. A core, a core part of her work is building tools and resources that help situate stakes in digital rights issues for the larger human rights movements. In her talk, she will discuss the role of effect and Facebook use in the Indian context. On a short-term note, I want to say that unfortunately Ramon Amaro can't be part of this panel today because of some health issues. He arrived in Berlin, but yeah, unfortunately um, he cannot join us, but we're wishing him um, a good recovery. And now a warm welcome to Carolyn. Um, yeah, please come. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I'm Caroline Sinders. Um, I am a machine learning UX designer, artist, and research fellow with Harvard University as well as a senior fellow with the Mozilla Foundation. I've spent the past seven years studying online harassment networks and systems. And inside of this, I'm particularly interested in how language is so contextual as well as conversation in these digital spaces, but how language and conversation can be weaponized, how it's parsed, how it's understood, and how it fits inside of social networks. And that fitting can be from a policy standpoint, how policy relates to language, 
or from a technical standpoint, how algorithms understand or rather look at words, or from a design standpoint, the, things, the ways in which we're able to interact on social networks, from the things we can post from a GIF to any kind of image or content. And I find this fascinating because I think language is both objective and subjective. It is literal and figurative. Language is truly complex, but language inside of any kind of technical system is a form of data. And I want to highlight an important project in this space when it comes to thinking about data, data from an ideological standpoint or data from artistic practice. And I want to highlight Mimi Onawa's work, The Library of Missing Data Sets, which, per which perfectly captures, I think, all of the nuances of data or even the nuances of a lack of data. Onoa writes, missing data sets are blank spots in otherwise data saturated spaces. The Library of Missing Data Sets started in 2016 is an ongoing physical repository of these things that have been excluded in a society where so much else is collected. And unsurprisingly, this lack of data typically correlates with issues affecting those that are most vulnerable in this context. The word missing is inherently normative. It implies both a lack and an ought. Something that does not exist but should. That which should be somewhere um, is not in its expected place. An established system is disrupted by a distinct absence. Just because some type of data doesn't exist doesn't mean that it's missing. And the idea of missing data sets is inextricably tied to a more expansive climate of inevitable and routine data collection. And why does this matter? That which we ignore reveals more than that which we give attention to. It's in, it's in these things that we find cultural and uh, colloquial hints of what is deemed important. Spots that we've left blank reveal our hidden social biases and indifferences. Mimi's project in particular, an image that you see highlights different kinds of missing data sets. And at times we can think of when it would be important to be seen by a system, how a system relates to you. If you're seen, then you exist. But there are many uh, other points inside of Mimi's collection of missing data, data where we wouldn't want things captured. What would it be like to have a list of all the mosques in one city that was very easy to find or collect? You can think of all the problems within that. And with this in mind, I've been thinking a lot about how do we look at data beyond the cold, the literal, and the mechanical. Data can be messy, qualitative, complex, and quite small. And conversations are data points, and conversations are emotional spaces, especially in digital systems. Our conversations are caught and saved as data, as emotional data. And as an artist and designer, I explore the in-betweens of conversation, how this emotion is saved in digital realms. How you take something that is inherently qualitative, like online harassment, and distill it into a quantitative data set. How do you take emotional trauma and try to save it into an Excel spreadsheet? And is this possible? Hannah Davis opened Transmediality talking about subjective data sets, which she describes as, data sets create a worldview. We have the ability to shape this worldview through working with a subjective data. This kind of subjective data allows us to explore the nuances of data the in-betweens of what a data set can be and what it should be. I think of this as a gray area of data sets, which brings me to this project I'm working on with the artist and technologist Ross Goodwin. I'm creating an emotional data set and a self-portrait algorithm. I'm using this project now as an example and metaphor for the deeper points of this presentation. I want to refer back to the first image of this presentation. This looks just like a random regular highway, and it's so mundane in its features. And to me, it's so completely American and benign. What's important about this is this is the entry point from where the water of Hurricane Katrina, one of the most devastating natural disasters in the United States, flowed into Gulfport, Mississippi in 2005. It completely, the leveled, it completely leveled the towns and the surrounding towns, and to the point to where what was mostly left were slabs of concrete, houses turned sideways. But how would a system see this image? What kind of data does this image represent? So I ran it through some out-of-the-box uh, AI. Uh, computer vision demos. And let's look at some of these experiments. What does Clarify sort of see? It sees travel, transportation, sky, no person, water, airport, sunset. Some of these are right and some of them are not right at all. And this is from Microsoft. Again, outdoor, beach, sky, sitting, harbor. There's a train apparently in here. That's news to me. Also a jet. That's, I don't see that either. Um, or a deep AI, which is a view of a city street at nighttime. Which is funny, because I, I took this when it was really sunny in the middle of the day. None of these really capture the nuance of what a hurricane would mean. None of these also really necessarily capture that truthfully what the image actually is. This isn't, you know, an image of a city taken at night. 
And more deeply, I wonder how we could understand and archive trauma when systems can't even acknowledge it. I grew up in New Orleans, Louisiana, a town affected by Hurricane Katrina, and my entire family for the past eight generations is from Gulfport. It's from the surrounding area. And that's the area where Katrina made landfall. And I've been photographing my family since 2005. What you see on the screen is a small slice of these images um, of this data set, which in, is also an archive. And at this point, I have a few thousand images, which is probably enough to train a computer vision model on, enough to create some kind of model, some kind of system around sentiment analysis. But there are more emotions here than just the big five inside of sentiment analysis, uh, which are fear, disgust, sadness, joy, and anger. Because the emotions in this data set um, aren't just a portion of anger or a small potential of joy, what I see are, is pain in many different shades of it, but I also see beauty. I see complexities and different flavors of feelings that are extremely hard to put into words. I see something that is a bit hard to quantify, a little impossible to taxonomize. And while this may seem unrelated to harassment, I think it's adjacent and it's very metaphorical. A hurricane is just a weather system. It's temperature, it's air pressure, it's location. It's weather data when analyzed by a technical system. But the effects of a hurricane are inherently traumatic and they're extremely human, as is online harassment. Online harassment at its core is social media data. It's words, it's time, it's location. But the effects of it are also extremely human. These are hard things to fit into boxes. They feel impossible to fit into spreadsheets and hard perhaps to put into data, but it's, it's full of data and that's what I'm interested in. The emotions that are hard to classify, the things that would sort of fit into what we could call a gray area. And that's a lot of what my work explores. And we see this gray area perfectly in social networks, particularly in their policies for defining harassment. Hate speech is a bit more concrete, but what about the different levels of harassment that are less literal, less concrete, more abstract? These are the things that are very hard to define in policy. Harassment is often extremely contextual. It can be continuing events that are not isolated. And at times, it's beyond just using a specific word or a specific kind of threat. So let me give you an example. Does someone you don't know favoring a tweet count as harassment? Maybe not in that one isolated event. What if they favor all of your tweets every day for a week? What about for a year? What if they favor and unfavor the same tweet every day for a year? What if you've asked them to stop? What I've described are many different forms of harassment, but would a system be able to recognize this kind of behavior? A person could. A person would, could feel uncomfortable, unsure, uh, it violated in this, in this space. It's hard for a technical system and for policy to define what I've described, though, as harassment. And what I've described is also harassment in a data point. It's about interactions, frequency, time, location. It's also about the context. Um, in social networks, all this data is caught and captured. Like my hurricane project, though, I'm interested in this hard to classify data, this extremely subjective data. This kind of gray area is the area that I work in. And it's the hardest to define in policy, but it exists in so many profound ways. And we see this with new and emerging uh, terms from neo-fascist and alt-right movements. Could we say that MAGA is hate speech or harassment? Well, what if we take it a step back and look at the ideolo ideology that that word represents? Some of the gray area of my research has been put into practice. In April 2018, I was invited to work with Amnesty International as a consultant on a Twitter study they were doing, one of the largest of its kind. Um, with, a few, with a few thousand volunteers, we hand labeled nearly 600,000 tweets on harassment and abuse directed at uh, female politicians and journalists in the United Kingdom. What we learned is that black women were disproportionately targeted and that women, regardless of political affiliation, to conservative or liberal were equally targeted with varying levels of harassment and abuse. I was brought in to, uh, I was brought in particularly to help design and conceptualize what kind of system we would need to build to label this data, how we could explain these labels to our volunteers, and the way to structure this. Effectively, I was brought in to try to label the messiness of human interactions in a way that a system could read. And this is sort of what it look, starts to look like. One of the things I designed for this label system were the categories of labels. And we started off with problematic, abusive, or none. After the publication of our research, Twitter's legal policy trust and safety lead, Vijay Gad, took umbrage with this term problematic, citing concerns of censorship. And I want to take a, a moment to offer a rebuttal to this. Problematic can be a good term and a great des descriptor for different kinds of content. Problematic helps us label and look at the gray areas around harassment. 
Social media companies do separate different kinds of harassing behavior into different forms or levels of harassment. Facebook does this in particular with classifying behaviors into different categories that have different citations, reparations, and outcomes. Bullying is their term for less severe harassment, and harassment is their term for more severe abuse. Instagram does this as well. And the reason I bring this up is it's important from a standpoint, especially when it's user-led research, to think about content and the way we relate to it beyond of it being thought of as a content takedown. Should harassment be only viewed in the lens of content moderation or uh, content that's so extreme that it must be removed? Harassment fits outside of that. Harassment is extremely, extremely contextual. And I, I work through some of these ideas around this space of problematic and the way it relates to the context of behavior, especially through diagrams, because behavior is so nuanced. And this diagram is an example of the kind of sketches I've made to work through. Doxing, the release of public documents, of, such as real names, phone numbers, credit cards, et cetera, um, are, um, oh, sorry. <laughs> Doxing, which is the release of public documents, real names, phone numbers, and credit card numbers, um, uh, is there are anti-doxing policies as a part of most companies' terms of service. In a sense, companies are recognizing that the use of doxing is actually a form of harassment. But are there forms of positive doxing? I can't think of any, and I've tried to, and I've looked through this. But what I find fascinating, though, is a space in which we can acknowledge what kind of behavior this is and the ways and all the context of how doxing can be misused. So from understanding different kinds of harassment data, such as Gamergate, which was a harassment campaign designed to push women marginalized groups out of uh, gaming communities, um, to trying to analyze large-scale catastrophes. Data is emotionally charged inside of social networks. Data is extremely personal. It's about people and their everyday lives. Data gets described as so many different kinds of metaphors. For example, data as oil. And generally, I find these metaphors to be extremely confusing. But the artist and technologist Jared Thorpe adds context to this oil metaphor, which I would like to share. He says, where oil is composed in compressed bodies of long ago dead microorganisms, personal data is made from the compressed fragments of our personal lives. It's, it's a dense condensate of our human experience. And from this definition, I think data is activated. It's reframed as the inherently personal. Our data inside of social networks is a reflection of ourselves, the, the many varying shades of ourselves, the previous lives we've lived online, the previous likes of ourselves. How data is caught and captured and copied has extreme political and emotional ramifications, especially inside of social networks. Thank you. Hello. Well, I talk about uh, Alex. He stays for Algorithm Exposed. It's a research project that uh, has got already a first uh, output, which is uh, Facebook Tracking Exposed, a technical tool that uh, is intended to make you understand how algorithm works uh, behind the scene. The thesis is that uh, algorithms are a political issue, in the sense that uh, they decide what uh, matter for, uh, for you and uh, who doesn't. But uh, as many other political issues, like, uh, I don't know, climate change, they are a bit abstract. It's difficult to communicate them between uh, non-experts why they matter. Algorithms are invisible. They act uh, in a in way that uh, we don't know yet, are quite uh, new in our society. So how we can uh, make the story compelling, that uh, is a challenge that uh, is still unsolved. But uh, considering uh, uh, some of you um, are um, in the art scene, in the activism, in the research uh, and, uh, and development, uh, working together is uh, our goal to understand uh, how this uh, political issue can become uh, more uh, tangible and concrete. But uh, before uh, talking about uh, how algorithm works, it's better take a step back and uh, try to view together how the Facebook algorithm works. We focus on Facebook because uh, it's uh, one of the biggest and compressive platforms uh, that uh, we, we have to deal with. Uh, 
but uh, this uh, approach can be applied to many other platforms. And still, this has been uh, our first um, achievement. Everything began when someone created a content. It can be you, or a bot, or an advertiser. Someone created content in Facebook. You already saw this uh, picture many times. You can select uh, some uh, feature, like uh, deciding uh, will be public or only for friends. And uh, when you give it to the black box of Facebook, Facebook attributes behind the scene some metadata. It's something you don't see. You have control of some of them on the, on the top of the um, table. You can see which are the metadata you believe to have control, like text analysis, because uh, if you write uh, some um, hate speech, uh, that's uh, behind the scene, uh, Facebook can flag it, can try to spot some pattern. If you are uh, adding some links, uh, the Facebook system will download a preview, and maybe will uh, blacklist certain kind of links because uh, they are uh, uh, blocked. You have some control on some option, but there are other options that uh, you are completely unaware. For example, it gets attributed uh, some um, uh, values based on uh, the IP address of the uh, place you are connected with. This uh, is happened to me when uh, I was recording some uh, new account uh, when I was doing a laundry in Berlin. I was in Meet. It, the computer I was using was uh, Virgin. Like, uh, there were not a trace of uh, previous navigation. It was just uh, creating new accounts uh, for uh, this kind of experiment. And uh, all the friends' uh, suggestions that I was getting, they were from uh, Turkish or Vietnamese people. Because, uh, I mean, that uh, was showing uh, the demographic that was mostly using uh, that Wi-Fi. Um, and there are other um, metadata, such as uh, emotions, that get attributed to. We don't know exactly how it works, but we are sure that this is happening. We know it because Facebook released a research some years ago that created a quite uh, outrage. It was the famous experiment evidence of massive scale emotional contagion through social networks. Basically, a nest experiment made on our, on our people. They took uh, 600,000 people, they split into groups. The first group will only see appearing in their newsfeed posts with uh, positive emotions and the other group post with a negative emotion, and then study if uh, they behave differently. Well, this has been uh, quite uh, outrageous because uh, uh, psychological research cannot be done on an aware subject, and is regulated how it works. But uh, at least uh, we know that uh, this was happening. <clears throat> Based on, uh, Maybe this kind, this kind of experiment or uh, um, outcomes in Facebook has been uh, used uh, during the years because uh, um, there is a more personal story shared by Karin Vajano on Twitter. Uh, she was part of a group of friends. One of these friends uh, went to the hospital uh, saying uh, in a public post, uh, I'm in the hospital, I'm sick, I'm going to get surgery next week. And uh, nobody saw this post. He died after the surgery. They found out uh, some months later. And that is an example on... Uh, um, how social dynamics can suffer some impact if uh, an algorithm is uh, deciding, sorry, <laughs> is deciding, uh, you know, Italians keep moving the hands, and th that is, uh, is the side effects. <laughs> and I make you laugh when we're talking about a dead person, whatever. <laughs> Next slide. Someone log into Facebook, and uh, Facebook look at the profile they have behind the scene, to understand what should be served to this person. So again, there are some metadata that you believe to have control. What you like, the, the friends you have, the page you follow, the settings you have. But then there are others outside of your comprehension. We don't even know which they are. But they are necessary for Facebook because they keep a profile also of people that are not active Facebook user. So for the Facebook user, it's just more data collected. And then, finally, Facebook decides what you're going to see. That is an example. I took uh, this uh, screenshot uh, yesterday night. Facebook creates an ephemeral timeline. It's ephemeral because uh, in the next time uh, we will log in, it uh, will be different. If you refresh the page, uh, some post will remain. Facebook believes that uh, you really have to see this. Or maybe it will never appear again. And in this account, I have uh, 143 friends. I follow 39 pages. 
I was not connecting uh, since yesterday and uh, since, okay, since 24 hours. And uh, in estimation, uh, the source I follow, they produce 100 posts. So Facebook pick uh, this selection. That is what we call uh, content prioritization or personalization algorithm or the invisible creation of content. But at the end of the day, this is a form of power deciding what will appear to you and what will not. What uh, will appear constantly on top or what uh, you have to look because you already know that you want that. And uh, it's a form of power uh, for which we can uh, more easily relate if we compare with the, news, uh, with the newspaper. The old media that uh, uh, we were thinking, uh, luckily we are getting rid of them because in the internet uh, we can find uh, the information we want. We are free to uh, publish our own content. content. That has been uh, the innovation potential of the internet. And in, in the last decades, uh, we saw how much was exciting and uh, uh, liberating this. That was the great part of the internet. But in these uh, days, uh, we are suffering of this uh, platform hegemony, an algorithm that decides uh, what uh, you can see. And uh, at least uh, with the form of the news media, we can understand uh, where we are in the middle of the spectrum. So if I'm uh, looking uh, on a, a news media that is uh, published uh, uh, with the money of the Vatican State, it's clear that uh, we'll have some kind of political opinion. I can understand uh, that uh, this uh, attribution, this quality, is something that is on the source and I can put in context. And so I can uh, take between the most extreme uh, left uh, media and the most extreme uh, right media and understand the different position. We understand each other because uh, we can see the other and put ourselves uh, in context. But uh, how you can do in Facebook? Because uh, everybody's got a personalized uh, ephemeral timeline. If you want to compare what you are getting, the only way is sharing your mobile phone to someone else. It's, it's, a, bit, uh, uh, it's a bit difficult, no? And anyway, imagining that uh, um, we can have control of the algorithm because uh, this uh, form of power should be democratically, democratically owned. But uh, we as society are not yet uh, literally um, ready to do a, this, a debate on uh, which is the right algorithm. Can exist the right algorithm? Can exist the fairest? No, probably not. In the same way, uh, also journalism can claim to be objective, but uh, there is always uh, a bias a background uh, uh, that uh, is inside of us uh, that uh, will uh, frame uh, our perce perception. So we made an experiment with uh, our tool. Uh, at the end, uh, we are doing a copy of what uh, the people see on their timeline. We do a copy of what Facebook gives to you. We don't touch what you give to Facebook. The goal is keep the algorithm accountable. And that uh, we came after in the presentation because uh, we really care on this ethos. We tried to compare between profile. But uh, if I compare my profile uh, with the one of Caroline and the one of Nayantara, uh, of course, it would be so different because we came from three different regions in the world. So there is no way to compare it. To do comparison, you need to have uh, some variable in common. Our six profiles made in this experiment were following the same pages. There were 30 pages across the political spectrum. They were accessing in the same time of the day and scrolling automatically so to capture the same amount of posts, be exposed to the same amount of information. They have zero friend and they just like different uh, uh, pages, content. La Repubblica, Il Fatto Quotidiano and Il Giornale are three Italian news media and uh, we are going to use the news media as a um, subgroup to do this uh, um, analysis. So the bot Number one was liking La Repubblica, and the number four, Il Fatto Quotidiano, and the number five, Il Giornale. To understand how the black box works, we have to see what enters and what goes out. What enters, you can see it if you look at the page of the news media and keep a copy. And that is what was entering. They produce a different amount of content, but this is not for Facebook. This is because they were behaving differently. The uh, editorial group of Il Giornale just have more people pasting uh, articles on uh, Facebook. And that means that in three months, uh, Il Giornale produced uh, the double of La Repubblica. That is uh, the, the input on the black box. Now, instead of you, we have to do a bet. This is a, a robot coupier. Uh, she or it works uh, on a casino in Japan. The bet you have to do is uh, if matter more, the filter bubble or 
if Facebook is a fair place to business? Which are the choice? I recap. If Facebook is a fair place to do business, means that our six user saw in the same percentage uh, this media. Because uh, they will be treated fairly, and uh, the user following the page uh, will uh, be um, neutrally served the content. If the filter bubble concept instead is the dominant one, means that uh, the first one will only see a blue bar, the fourth will see a yellow bar, and uh, the fifth, il giornale, will see the green bar. Now, now, mm, well, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because nobody ever count. But, <laughs> but uh, do this bet uh, in yourself. Ready? Well, the truth is that uh, nobody won because uh, in an oppression system, uh, you just uh, uh, are subject to the decision of someone else. Let's see what does it mean, this data. In the uh, bot number one, the one that was liking uh, content from La Repubblica, the blue one, we see the filter bubble concept that is true. You are, that bot is getting more of La Repubblica than anybody else. The second and the third, uh, there were other bots uh, that they were not liking anything of these three media, and still La Repubblica keeps be present. The fourth one is the one liking the yellow, but uh, who knows why, is also the one taking a lot of the green. And La Repubblica always present. The fifth one is uh, the one liking the green, which, uh, by the way, is the one that was making the most effort to um, appear in the timeline, is the one that was producing more content, but at the end of the day, seems to be the, the least, uh, the, least <laughs> the, the most mistreated. And uh, again, in the sixth profile, uh, La Repubblica keep appearing. That uh, is a way to do some accountability of the algorithm, checking how the input is treated and understand what is happening in the middle. Not in details. We can never understand all the metadata that Facebook is using and all the, all the logic behind. But at least we can start to understand the, and the, have metrics in, uh, in mind. The point is uh, we were looking at the source uh, name, but uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> you should decide uh, what uh, you get because uh, um, the perception, the, the selection and the creation of content has a huge influence on, uh, on the final message. No? And uh, who decides my priority? In theory, I won't decide my priority. Only I can know what uh, matters, and uh, that is uh, our uh, political goal, make uh, individual uh, capable to run their own algorithm. But uh, in this moment, uh, the status quo is a bit shit, shit. Yeah. It's a bit different. I'm changing the goal I give our product teams from focusing on helping you find relevant content to help you have more meaningful social interaction. When I use uh, Comic Sun, it's because it's uh, a Facebook uh, quote. <laughs> uh, <laughs> anyway, this is the promise. We know that uh, the algorithms are used to influence the debate, and uh, Facebook uh, is happy to claim that they will change their algorithm to make a better conversation. But only I can know what is a good conversation for me, because I change during my time. I want to explore different things, or I can just uh, get updates from my family. But it's pointless to enable only a researcher because, again, we'll be, uh, we in our ivory, ivory tower uh, saying that Facebook is bad, claiming uh, and advocating more transparency, uh, be at the same steps with uh, uh, their lobbyists and uh, lose on making uh, points to the government. So enabling a researcher is pointless because uh, this is a social issue and uh, we should understand as a society how to be digitally literate and why this has an impact on us. And that's why our tool works in uh, every people that uh, has a Facebook account. And uh, we are uh, making uh, progress in implementing uh, to cover other platform. It's a browser extension that uh, you can install on uh, Chrome or on Firefox. And um, this website, uh, I mean, you can uh, spam it to your friend, friend. Thank you. Please do it. What happens when you install it? On top of every post collected, not every post is collected. Only the post shared with the world, not the one shared with friends. When a post is collected, you get a link on top that can lead to your data. And you can see a personal data summary. This is a copy of what you get, what we are processing because you send it to our server. And this, I mean, is not yet enough to understand anything about polarization because you are just making a copy of yourself. But then you can start to test with your friend who is getting different content. And this is an example on how three different bots 
the bots of the experiment of before, were perceiving information on a racist attack that happened last year in Macerata in Italy. I mean, the Venn diagram is quite uh, um, clear to show that uh, two of them uh, were getting a lot of information, some of them in common, some was unique for them, and another profile was getting a, a huge minority, uh, a small amount of information on this specific subject. You can download uh, the CSV of the data collected, and uh, we are working on more functionality to let you play with your friends and uh, with your uh, group of, uh, I don't know, ally, uh, colleagues, uh, uh, students, uh, to test, uh, because uh, we cannot expect that an algorithm will tell to you how you should get informed. It's only through peer review of people who understand the context that you can understand uh, what are you missing and put in discussion that maybe what you believe uh, do not depends on you but it depends on the fact that some algorithm has decided that you should only see this or that. And then you can run a more creative comparison and understand the more matrix, matrix to judge the algorithm. That are numbers and concepts we lack. In this example, all the columns are one of the profile, of the six, the um, row, they are days, and instead of every row, you have the amount of uh, photo, post, or video that were appearing on the timeline. So you see that uh, on the first uh, uh, column, you get a post for the 57% and a photo for the 39%, and that pattern seems the same during the days. In the second profile, you get the majority is photo. And that is a way to understand how someone else is getting a different information diet, we call it. And that was part of the uh, uh, political experiment uh, that we made during the Italian election. The one getting a picture was the far-right uh, uh, bot that was liking only far-right content. And, uh, well, we wrote, uh, we wrote a more extensive documentation because the three um, academic publications have been made out of this uh, data collection. Anyway, this is a conflict, and uh, we are facing some challenges of two kinds, mostly. One is uh, legal and the other is technological. And uh, Spotify Teardown is a book published by Meet Press that uh, uh, talks about the story of a fin Finnish uh, or Swedish, Swedish researcher. Uh, they get uh, threatened by Spotify because they were testing the algorithm in a similar way we are doing uh, on, on Facebook. Spotify also sent an email to the um, um, equivalent of the Ministry of Education saying, probably you don't know, but your researcher is doing something bad. Luckily, the institution was on the side of the researcher because uh, if we accept that the term of condition forbid to us to understand what's going on, we cannot expect transparency from platform. They benefit on it. And uh, the, other, the other challenge is technological, because, uh, I mean, compared to our um, team uh, that is uh, composed by less than 10, than, than 10 people, the technological power of Facebook uh, is clearly uh, a bit unmatched. And that uh, is a story from uh, uh, ProPublica, they were running a transparency tool that was, work, was collecting political advertising. As an approach similar to ours, that has been blocked. Our is still uh, surviving, but uh, it's a challenge. Our goal in the long term is that everybody should run their own algorithm, change it when they want, uh, have uh, an algorithm that you can customize it, test it, and uh, implement uh, your own policy in this way. We cannot ask and pretend that everybody will be a, a software developer capable to write their own algorithm. But uh, at least this ecosystem can permit to implement uh, your values and share it among peers. Um, yeah. <laughs> ah, yeah. Election. Are, uh, uh, it's time to close. Yes. No, yeah. <laughs> Election uh, is a... Um, are the moment in which uh, Western countries feel, uh, not only Western, but uh, Western countries normally don't feel uh, to be concerned uh, on algorithm or privacy issue. But during the election, uh, we feel that uh, our uh, attention has a value. And so, because uh, we feel that uh, we can be more exploited, it's the right time to run a campaign, a campaign that uh, asks to citizens uh, like you to install the web extension and to participate in this collective experiment. I highlighted the goals and ethos because it explains which are the safe limitations we impose in ourselves to protect uh, your data if they are present, because the goal, again, is studying phenomena, algorithm or propaganda, not individual behavior. 
A unit in Tracking Exposed is the campa campaign website we will run uh, in the next month to do this uh, uh, analysis and publish uh, updates. Uh, this is part of the Alex project, which uh, has uh, got uh, funding from the European Research Council, and that uh, can permit us to uh, run on public money, don't try to do any kind of business uh, on, uh, on data, besides the ethical uh, uh, self-constraint. We have also a mandate on um, develop a product that uh, want to test how a data set can be a collective resource and uh, how it can be used to understand the phenomena, but not individual behavior. The target audience uh, that uh, we have uh, are uh, five kind. Okay, those are four because the website is not yet complete. But uh, <laughs> let's see which day of them they are. Social scientists, they are uh, the most uh, interesting because uh, uh, normally they want to test uh, how the algorithm has an impact uh, on uh, society. Is there a slide? <laughs> but uh, they cannot uh, develop a tool. We want to be a tool used by others to enable um, critical judgment. Every Facebook user to understand himself, who knows how to transform, how to transform the data? Because uh, those visualizations are made uh, by a uh, digital activist. Uh, it's not the best way to communicate. Maybe you can uh, figure out something better. And political candidate and advertiser, because they believe to be disintermediated. But actually, they are not. So those are the website. Um, EU19 is already online, but uh, during this month we will finalize uh, the services offered. And the Algorithm Exposed will be the academic front end of the project. Facebook, Facebook Tracking Exposed is the website we started to build two years ago, and now will become the technical reference. And that uh, is uh, the final message, because uh, we can uh, claim to... Uh, <laughs> we can claim that uh, we can delete Facebook, and uh, indeed, if you can, uh, uh, good for you. But uh, we can also believe that Facebook is dead because the teenagers are going to Instagram. But uh, uh, I mean, Europe uh, has an average uh, age uh, that uh, is over 50, or maybe over 40, I don't know. And, and uh, the, um, the generation that uh, learn how to use the internet with Facebook, they will uh, keep uh, uh, voting uh, and be informed through Facebook. And uh, that's why it's a political issue. We cannot uh, imagine that Facebook will finish their power soon. That is all. Thank you. <laughs> So thank you, um, the three of you, for your very compelling inputs and presentation. I have a lot of um, questions already, but maybe we could start um, with uh, the question of categories and context realization. So um, because what also is a problem is how Facebook is using content moderators and how they also fail. So it's like categories that are pre-set up that we just saw in Nayantara's presentation, but also content moderation by human beings. So maybe it would be nice to um, the both of you this question. So maybe you could explain it a bit um, from your perspective, from your research. How, how, like, what are the boundaries? What are the, maybe the biases and so Sure, so I mean, if we look at Facebook as a particular use case, and I think uh, ProPublica did a lot of really great reporting in this specifically on content moderation as well as a documentary called The Cleaners. Um, there are different kinds of ways in which content moderators have to understand, look at content, and they have to react to the policy in a very quick way. So from ProPublica's research, um, there was this kind of like mathematical equation moderators have to go through, which is uh, what's being said, but also what is what's being like what is being written, who is that directed to, and where does that class of person fall? And in this case, it was something where the group white men were a more protected group than per se black children, based off this strange mathematical equation they had come up with. Um, I think the deeper problem is that 
other than that obviously being extremely problematic equation and system is that content moderators have only a couple seconds to make any kind of quick decision as to what they're looking at, but more importantly, the tools that they use um, lack so much context. So they're looking at things that are incredibly isolated. Um, so in, in something I was trying to make a point of in my, uh, in my presentation, what happens if you are receiving continuing harassment? So if someone is liking and unliking something over the period of a year, well, you could get 365 different content moderators looking at that. So they wouldn't be able to see the longer term context. What they're seeing is everything at a, at a very individualistic level. And I think that's true even if, if, if you look at hate speech inside of viral memes, for example. They're seeing individual pieces of content, not the entire trend of it. That's because when the content is reported, it's going to individual moderators, right? It's not going as a collective whole. But my only takes is that content moderation depends heavily in uh, culture and change with time. In theory, the content moderator is the person that uh, is keeping care of, of the small community. And uh, why should not be someone I select? Why should not be someone paid by Facebook, uh, but outside of uh, Facebook logic of employment? In this way, we can assume that uh, you can uh, better be protected by someone who is sharing uh, your uh, um, political or local values without uh, being subject to the fact that uh, Facebook invests in a country only when they are profitable. And only after outrage uh, like the uh, lynch in uh, Sri Lanka um, of, the, of the last year, they start to hire new people that were talking that languages, otherwise uh, there will be backslash in the press. But the solution to be systemic should permit to uh, having a better representation of the diversity of, of the world, because otherwise uh, uh, we'd be only based on the first uh, languages and the most profitable region. Anything or? Okay. Um, what I would be interested um, for Caroline is um, in your workshop yesterday, we talked about how to build a feminist data set. So um, I'm really curious, like what are the inherent problems or difficulties you have when you sort of try to open a black box or open a data set and um, yeah what could be like a like a good way of approaching um, say a feminist data set sure I think that there's a lot to unpack there and if we sort of look back at at, at Nayantara's presentation for example um, how do we create data sets that are highly contextual or that are, I guess, um, highly charged? So hate speech, for example, hate speech differs culture to culture and differs place to place. And some partially in my workshop yesterday, we also talked about hate speech symbols specifically from the American alt-right. So being able to understand uh, the nuances of a conversation is extremely important. I think that's also, um, I think that's something we're all touching on today. Uh, with feminist data set, a lot of that was in reaction to the research I was doing in the American alt-right because I effectively was building a neo-Nazi data set by analyzing different hate speech terms they were using. And I'm sure as you can imagine, looking at neo-Nazi data fucking sucks, <laughs> like for lack of a better phrase, um, but it's a lot. And I was interested in thinking about well, what is an artistic practice that sort of confronts um, on this, this growing fascist ideology, this sort of space of inequality, and granted from an American standpoint, right? I'm an American and a lot of the data that I look at, a lot of the different groups that I'm in culturally, I sort of end up in an American filter bubble. But a lot of feminist data set is also thinking about what does it mean to be seen inside of a data set? There, um, a lot of feminist data, if we think about it, is hard to find because it's written works. Um, the campaign Art and Feminism Wiki Edit-a-thon was sort of in a similar vein of, you can't be what you can't see, so how do you create spaces of easy to find feminist data, feminist artistic practitioners, or feminist text in, a, in one space that's easy to find? How do you create effectively more feminist archives? So feminist data set sort of comes from that point of trying to collect and aggregate a lot of, a lot of this. How it's used as a data set is sort of up to those that choose to engage the data set, that choose to use it and apply it to something else. I would be also interested in um, the question, what would it mean to intervene at the level of the data and the level of the algorithm? So maybe um, we talked about that before. Uh, maybe you could just um, 
yeah, make the distinction between maybe media theory, which <laughs> is more interested in it, and you said like practically um, it doesn't really matter, but that would be interesting to um, yeah find out. But feel free the others also to answer that because I just don't want to ask just Caroline. So uh, yeah, I guess prior to the panel, we were all sort of huddling since we we're missing, sadly, a co-panelist. Um, and one of the questions you had brought up is, is there a difference between, I guess, algorithmic uh, protest or data protest or algorithmic action or activism and data activism? And in, I would say in a media theory space, there are differences, but in a practical advocacy space, there probably are not. If we look at it from a policy standpoint, the way that you would regulate or look at or legislate algorithms and data um, from a user perspective, so under like a privacy lens would probably be similar. Um, but I mean, I think words are important. Data is a part of algorithms, but a data set and an algorithm can be completely separate things. So it's kind of this thorny knot to sort of pull out. Um, and then I think a deeper problem is also, does the general public understand that pipeline, the differences of data, the differences of algorithms, how data can be weaponized separately, how an algorithm can be weaponized separ separately and how they are together. And I think we're getting closer to that kind of awareness with things like... This will not automatically translate uh, in a better society. Because uh, also with the uh, distributed information network, uh, when we were capable to find uh, the right information uh, in, uh, in the right blog, uh, let, us f let us felt empowered, let us feel empowered but we are also exposed to misinformation because we lack of the proper tool to do the critical judgment. Anyway, in this historical moment, we have the platform hegemony, and I assume that we should find something in the middle as an uninformed society, but because we are not yet informed, the best way to show an alternative is just to enable individual, make them experiment, make them have success and failure, and thank you to that, be capable to elaborate what can be the dimension in the, in the next future. Otherwise, in this moment, the knowledge is in few actors, and they teach to us what is good and what is correct in algorithm decision, in automated decision making. If that knowledge just remains there, I mean, how we can never the informed debate. So I'm not for a national solution. But if that is a part of the stories and the reason that are used to justify that there should not exist a central platform that dominate the world discussion, that can be one of the ways just to, to speak about. I have a very last question for Claudio and then we open to the public. There are two microphones over there and over there. So please do feel free to ask us any questions. How many uh, Facebook accounts do you have? Because I saw you had quite some over there. Um, I have uh, one Facebook account for every persona the surveillance capitalism machine keep tab of, of me. Okay, I explain it better. Uh, you believe to be only one person, but you are not. Because the way you behave uh, at Bergain is different from how you behave uh, in your workplace, no? So when you put this kind of two life in the same profile, you believe that you are talking to different bubble, but Facebook has a special value for you because you are the only person in the world connecting to different social networks. And everybody of us is unique. The social graph is so diverse that what makes us unique is that we connect the network that nobody else in the world connects. So I try to do a self-analysis in which small world network I, be I belong. A small world network is a place where everybody knows each other. In every small world network, I should have a dedicated Facebook account. And that is clearly a bit uh, schizophrenic. But uh, as it's useful in a certain context. For example, when I uh, relocate in Brazil, I create a Brazilian account to get in touch with the Brazilian network. And when I was uh, uh, abroad, I was not using it. In the moment uh, I go to work in a new place uh, and I create a new account, uh, when uh, this uh, experience ends, uh, it's simpler to cut uh, your connection instead of having uh, this issue of uh, information that leaks uh, and friends uh, that see what are you doing in other contexts. It's uh, more control on uh, your uh, digital sphere. So now we're four. <laughs> There's a question. Um, hello, um, thank you very much for this um, inspiring panel. 
Um, I had a question for Claudio. Um, and so I'm, I'm aware that you're trying to, um, among other things, explain um, this question through, um, through your research on algorithms. But um, what did you make of the fact that um, Il Repubblica, um, which is um, the center-left journal, was the most promoted by Facebook, which I found it a bit surprising? Yeah, it's nice because uh, Italians that know the context uh, guess, uh, and you see what they expect from the algorithm. Someone say it's because Repubblica has the, uh, the most amount of likes, but that means that the algorithm is reinforcing the, the majority of the score. Or someone uh, say, uh, is because Republica is the most bipartisan. But that means uh, that uh, the algorithm flatten uh, your vision, making something uh, uh, mainstream more, uh, more visible. I don't know, we can get just a guess, but the point is uh, I don't want to reverse uh, the algorithm. Just uh, let us uh, open the debate and ask to quest this question to Facebook or find solution independently for them, from them. There's a question. Hi, thanks. Hi, thanks for the panel. Uh, my name is Maya, and it's really nice to see a panel where I know literally everybody and have worked with them. Um, it's nice to see you presenting your work. Um, so my question is about optimization technologies, and there's actually a really interesting workshop going on right now about optimization. And I've recently become quite interested in how we don't, well, actually I'm curious about how does optimization work? Do we have any insight into that in what platforms are doing, because it's not just about the data set and the algorithms. Certain things are being made more visible uh, because they're profitable or this is what most people want or something like this. So is that a space for advocacy, um, algorithmic advocacy or you know, uh, data advocacy? And can you speak about that in your own work or practice and especially looking inside companies and how they work? Do you have any special person you want to ask uh, the no, question? Whoever has experience with it, because I don't think that a lot of people in our space broadly talk about optimization enough. And so, but, so uh, I'm, I don't know who, who would respond to that. It's open to all of them. Thanks, my second answer. Thanks, second answer is, uh, well, that is uh, indeed a, a way to do advo advocacy. Because, for example, uh, in the last years, uh, Facebook was allegedly pushing for uh, videos. But that uh, was a corrupted matrix that does make uh, people that were creating content change their behavior to catch up uh, with the last uh, policy of Facebook. And it's not okay that uh, the platform decide which content get more um, penalized or promoted. So mostly it's for fairness that uh, is, is not okay. I actually don't have much of a background or study in optimization, but um, I, th I think just even posing the question, I think that there should be more of a space or focus on that in advocacy, especially building off Claudio's example of Facebook's perceived push towards, um, or their actual push towards video, the inflated metrics around it, um, how, how that came about, how it destroyed so many newsrooms because they had to pivot to, to video, and then that ended up actually being this kind of inflated ad sense. Um, I think that that is a space that should be focused on very much so in, in, a, um, in the human rights and NGO world, or just in general in a space of a advocacy and activism. So you should, you should do something about that, Maya. <laughs> Hi, Antara, you want to add something or shall we go to the next? Okay, please, next question. Hi, thank you very much for the panel. And the question I have relates actually to um, identification of hate speech and fake news, but in terms of like WhatsApp and messaging. So when it's not that visible, such as in your social media. I come from Brazil and we're having a problem there where we had a person, a very bad person we elected, mainly through the use of WhatsApp. So I'm wondering what is being developed in terms of identification of this, um, you know, of hate speech, fake news and spread or what's been done to counter that, because so that's basically what happened, that's how he got elected. Thank you. Anybody? Yes. I have a small comment, because uh, it's fascinating, because uh, WhatsApp has been the first network to make end-to-end -end encryption a mainstream product. But uh, a security feature brings uh, with uh, its own uh, some uh, effects, uh, such as uh, you cannot understand uh, what's uh, passing through. You cannot understand who is spamming, who is uh, making activity like a bot. And uh, this uh, means that uh, the individual has uh, a fully encrypted channel, but uh, is uh, more uh, left alone in deciding uh, the quality of the data that he's getting. 
The, the feature uh, highlighted by Nayantara is interesting because it's an example on how you can try to limit uh, the spread of one message, allegedly, intervening in a feature. But uh, I mean, if I'm organizing a birthday party and I have to forward uh, the same message to multiple people, I can do copy-paste differently, I can just uh, make more interaction with my device to invite everybody and uh, forward the message as uh, I'm supposed to do. So this kind of limitation just uh, show how an organized group that is forwarding uh, um, messages on a close group uh, can uh, have uh, a more uh, interaction to do to reach the same amount of um, uh, spreading of the information. What we lack uh, is um, the ability to judge the quality of the content, and that is uh, where we have to work. And there's one last question for the panelists. Okay. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a software developer, so I have a very technical question for, um, I think, Claudio. Uh, you said that uh, we should have an ability to code our values into the algorithm, but contemporary algorithms are not if, then, if, then, else. It's more like a function uh, out of uh, features extracted from uh, the data. So, uh, how do you imagine, how uh, can we technically, for, um, technically do that? Because uh, imagine, uh, tomorrow uh, Facebook open sources its algorithm, but we can't do it re re anything with it, with it. Got it. Uh, so, because the algorithm nowadays is looking at the whole network, we can never replace on our client the same computational ability. That uh, is granted. Uh, the first step, a highlight is that uh, most of the time we do selection, this cannot be based on uh, deep learning. This can be based on the source selection or other quality that are, let's say, linear function, and you can have them uh, on uh, your client. What uh, is necessary is that uh, the platform will give a machine readable format without any kind of prioritization, and you client side decide what should be shown. And then, because the algorithm should keep in account also on uh, um, network dynamics and uh, social dynamics, you may have uh, other third party who give to you additional values and you can integrate those values in your algorithm. That can permit to separate uh, the platform, we, which will become more uh, neutral on the content, letting the intelligence be at the border of the network. And then other parties involved in this uh, market that provide or algorithm or uh, um, feature and qualitative assessment that uh, will let you, your algorithm perform better. Yeah, thank you very much, Nayantara, Caroline, and Claudio. And um, with this is, was the last question. So we thank you very much uh, for coming by. And uh, yeah, another uh, good recovery wish to Raman from our side. And yeah, have a nice day at Transmediale. Thank you.